Thank you, uh, Mita. Um, uh, one thing I've certainly learned in this conference is not ever to follow Mita again in a, in a presentation, because where hers was concise, pointed, insightful, mine will be none of those things. Um, Noah said that he had two hours worth of recording available, so I took, I'm going to take two hours uh, for my comments. Um, I'm just kidding, sorry. I'm going to make people panic here. Um, so, uh, certainly, of course, I want to thank uh, Krishnendu for um, the invitation to comment uh, today uh, on the conference, especially given that, uh, honestly, I'm sort of an oddball uh, and an outlier uh, in this field, although I'm learning so, so much. I have done some work on street vendors, but not nearly as much as the collective wisdom in this room. Um, and uh, I also just, uh, again, want to thank, I know we've done it, but it, you can never do enough, thank uh, Jacqueline and Noah. Uh, for the uh, many, many of you know how much work it takes to put these things together and run them, and it, it's just, we, we owe them a great debt of gratitude. And of course, thanks to all the presenters and commenters who shared their work. So, um, the papers uh, presented in this conference have illuminated um, a suite of urban practices uh, that often remain hidden in plain sight. Uh, and not, that, that is not just buying and selling of things on the street, but what we mean by the very term street itself as a multivalent signifier that operates across discursive, colloquial, uh, technical, and phantasmal registers. And not just filling our guts uh, with, uh, uh, and getting calories into our bodies, uh, but the meanings we make of the foods that we consume, where we consume them, how, when, and with whom. Not just the occupation and use of otherwise inert public space, but practices that literally shape and reconfigure public spaces. Street vending as a laborious, vibratory, multiform, city-making endeavor, a modality of planning and economic development by other means, an urban whirling, to paraphrase Ai Wong and Ananya Roy. Turn page. <laughs> um, the presentations have illuminated uh, a wide range of spatial affordances and materialities uh, deployed by street vendors to make room for themselves in crowded cities, to organize and promote their wares to hurried and distractive consumers, to connect to more extensive networks, and to form collectivities for advancing their interests. Uh, the presentations reveal street vendors not only as participants in nested moral and monetary economies, but as part of a broader urban imaginary that frames everyday life in globalizing cities. On the one hand, an ensemble of routine material transactions. On the other hand, a web of performative sites, codes, and practices that tie people together into ambits of negotiation and care, often across multiple lines of difference. And the presentations have illuminated street vendors themselves. No longer that, uh, just that churro lady on the subway, right? But real people with hopes and dreams and aspirations. People with rich and complicated lives. People who work to support their families and ensure a good life for their children. Above all, we see real men and women engaged in extremely hard work. Rising early in the morning, spending hours in preparation, conducting business until late in the evening, and commuting across great differences. Often, especially in the case of women, mixing their work as vendors with child and elder care uh, op uh, obligations. The papers presented in this conference have also in many ways established the state of art of research on the topic of street vending, drawing on an oppressive range and mix of methods. Some of you are engaged in thick description, rendering extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily detailed and richly textured studies through in-depth ethnographies, conducting fieldwork in a wide variety of sites and locations. Um, others, like Stefano and others, are engaged in uh, work with very large data sets and quantitative analysis, grappling not only with how to produce clean data, but also with how to visualize that data through ideographic and geolocational means. Such endeavors are crucial uh, for grounding advocacy campaigns, policy proposals, and legal supports. Still others, uh, like, uh, like Annaline and Ashley and Heather, uh, are engaged in the interpretive methods of historical research, often in circumstances where the archive itself is silent, disorganized, or fragmentary, 
or were the challenges to read against the grain of the archive, produced as it is uh, by the very agents of governmentality that are reacting to street vendors as a problematique for regulatory intervention, surveillance, and control. In all cases, the work emerging from this conference, to me, uh, points to new ways of conceptualizing, contextualizing, tra and tracing the work of, of street vendors across space and time. From considerations of, intersection of, of the intersection of gender, race, and class, to the unpacking of public policy in both democratic and authoritarian regimes, to reckoning the politics of the street and the agonistic struggles over public space, the presentations of situated street vending within an intricate web of signifiers that link identity to economy to everyday urban experience. And um, lastly, at least in this first part uh, of my presentation, I, I, I want to draw back to the introductory remarks uh, that Krishnu made, where he laid down really what I uh, saw as a very well-considered gauntlet of challenges for future research. Uh, and I think session commentators have really done a good job of adding uh, to these challenges as well and, and meeting some of these challenges. Some of these have to do with uh, the kinds of research we are engaged in, such as the need for more comparative work. Um, always mindful of the trade-offs, of course, between comparative analysis and the deep dive uh, of single-site studies. Uh, I think challenges ably taken up uh, in the work of Jane uh, Battersby, for example, and Giselle Yasmin. Um, other challenges speak to the need to refine categories such as gender, race, class, ethnicity, and, uh, and citizenship, taking care to examine these at their intersections and their interstices, particularly in the, uh, in the context of increasing urban diversity through large-scale diasporic movements, refugee crises, and other ways in which people are mobilized globally. Still other challenges have to do with uh, the attention to food itself. As Mark noted, and, 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 and Inter reminded us, uh, very often what we really are describing in our studies of street food vendors is a constellation of social relations embedded in various regimes of regulation, statecraft, and political economy. But what about the food, right? How does the food matter? After all, we could be talking about the vending of any items on the street, not just food, but clothes, electronics, household goods, compact discs and DVDs, all the kinds of things you see uh, in the markets when, you're, when you go there. So if we're looking at street vending through the lens of food studies, what do we need to say about the food, right? About its nutritional and caloric profile, seen in Stefano's uh, project, the origins of ingredients, the traditions and innovations in cuisine and cooking methods, the adaptation of foods to new places and circumstances, the role of taste in forging communities and senses of belonging, um, the ways in which food traditions and uh, vendor cuisines are optimized around particular forms of labor and hard work. Uh, for example, the high calories and, and fat as crucial to the diets of hardworking people who might only eat once or twice per day. And finally, there is the challenge to explore that elusive yet all-important maze of scale. That is, to begin identifying and detailing the linkages between the micropolitics and situational conditions of street vending on the one hand, and the shifting national and global political economies of food production, distribution, wholesaling, and retail that comprise the raiment of commercial exchange. And we saw this, I think, most visibly uh, and vividly in Jane's presentation on the Kitoy market. So um, what I want to do uh, before my time is up is to sort of identify some emerging themes uh, in the papers, um, that at least things that I saw emerging, uh, a cluster uh, and of things at times predominating uh, that I feel like have consolidated around uh, the work that has been presented uh, uh, for the past two days. And the first theme that I want to uh, sort of uh, meditate on a bit is uh, the theme of the porous boundary between the informal and the formal, uh, including what uh, Rita has just uh, very aptly called the liveliness uh, of the law, which I, I love, and I'm going to steal that phrase all I can uh, in, in future papers, I hope. I'll, I'll give you a citation. <laughs> um, or how, uh, how does what Giselle called the foodscape uh, draw together multiple strands of the alimentary economy? How do the informal and informal constitute one another? What are the meaningful differences of the same, uh, when the same activities can fall on either side of a line depending simply on their, their orientation to the regulatory ambit of the state. 
After all, the formal economy is often shaped by and dependent upon informal ties, networks, obscurances, and spectral actions. Uh, as Tina, in fact, noted in the question and answer uh, sessions uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, formal, laws, uh, uh, formal laws and regulations are only part of the story, right? And in this sense, a great proportion of the transactional costs and agreements within the highest scales of the so-called formal economy do themselves unfold through informal means, right? Um, and meanwhile, back on the ground, how do vendors themselves selectively mix and deploy formal and informal routines code switching between the two for positional advantage. Another theme that has emerged is, is the difficulty and importance of bringing together perspectives of labor, capital, and culture. And here let us recall that street vending, above all else, is very, very hard work. However it might be exoticized or romanticized by hipsters, television, food, and travel programs, and guidebooks, selling food on the street is phenomenally hard labor. After all, street vending is an avenue of social reproduction that substitutes labor for capital, one, a, 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 a form which, not incidentally, provides a massive subsidy for the formal avenues of capital accumulation in the world. Or as my former New School colleague, Abdul Malik Simone, uh, would put it or has argued, uh, the, this mass substitution of labor for capital creates infrastructure by other means. And Tina's work, of course, uh, has echoed that, where she shows uh, such labor substituted for capital is manifest in, this, in the schedule and the duties of street vendors themselves, from the early morning waking to the many hours of preparation and sourcing to the setting of display of wares, the exhausting negotiations with customers, the tedious hours of waiting in the long commutes home. People enter the street vending trade for a variety of reasons and at different life stages, depending on a complex array of household economies and needs. At the same time, what does it mean when street food has achieved cachet as a form of cultural capital? Street food has been brought into restaurants, made palatable at a commensurate price, and deployed as a signifier for canny consumption. Television, food, and travel programs celebrate street food, often engaging in some of the lamest tropes of Orientalism and exoticization. And as an antidote, I would highly recommend viewing the excellent series on street food produced by Al Jazeera from 2012 to 2014. It's actually quite good. Another emerging theme has been the paradoxical role of policy. This is one I was especially glad to see. On the one hand, sound and well-delineated public policies can provide an enabling environment for street vendors, right? But public policy often comes down as a blunt instrument, one that does not take into account the many needs, constraints, and conditions faced by street vendors. This is particularly evident, as Trudy shows us, in the outright ban on street vending enacted in Bangkok. All too often, policies reflect a heritage of animus, against the street vendor as a troubling figure in the city's public spaces, the rootless, the ungovernable, the slippery trickster who evades the law. So that even when efforts are made to absorb street vendors into the formal regulatory apparatus, they are often effective in a way that perpetuates those ancient tropes, making the work of street vending all the more onerous and taxing. Um, and we saw in Jane's uh, presentation, I think a really useful cautionary tale about the shortcomings and the contradictory outcomes of EU-funded street market relocations uh, and developments. This suggests uh, to me, and I think uh, to others, uh, Krishnindu even raised this in the beginning, the need uh, for a post-liberal framework for the legal status of street vendors, although one size will never fit all, as, as we uh, so aptly uh, put it, uh, for the legal status of street vendors, a, a kind of framework that takes into account collective and usufructory rights that grounds adjudication not in uh, the claims of individuals, but of uh, social groups. It also requires us to attend to Mark's important charge uh, that we move beyond discussions based in democratic poli uh, polities and take into account the place of street bending in autocratic societies. Indeed, we might be surprised by what we find. In, in my own experience uh, in doing research in, in, uh, in the authoritarian monarchy of Morocco, uh, for instance, street vending is a relatively settled feature of the urban landscape, right? Uh, whereas in others, it is simply not. Uh, or, or in India, for example, as uh, Shalini has so ably demonstrated, democratic deliberation doesn't necessarily guarantee the effective and just application of the law 
or the automatic conferral of capacity in asserting collective claims. Another theme to emerge has been the central role of gender in the work of earning a living on the street. And here I'm thinking of Joe's incredibly compelling personal account of women's restricted access to public space, in particular the rough and tumble space of the market. Shalini's crucial insights uh, about the particular uh, uh, encumbrances on uh, women vendors, whether that be from uh, the kind of particular dangers they face in public space, uh, the, the demands of uh, reproductive activities and labor, uh, or the fact that they may be selling largely perishable goods. Um, and I saw this up close in my own work in East Africa, uh, uh, which was really interesting, and, and Stefano, you may have seen this too, where on the Muslim-dominated coast, men comprise the vast majority of buyers and sellers, but if you just go a few, uh, a few miles inland into the upcountry uh, of Kenya or Tanzania, uh, you'll, you'll see women predominating in many uh, phases of the food provisioning system. Heather Lee's fascinating work showed us new dimensions of masculinity and consumption, where the imbibing of certain foods and, and uh, uh, functions is a kind of talisman for manhood. I love that. All of this suggests that street food vending is a practice almost tailor-made to provoke tensions uh, around gender. <laughs> food, as a sorry, food as a fundamental necessity of social reproduction is always caught up in moral economies of care, which are gendered in all sorts of ways, and the provision of food on the street conjures uh, uh, up shifting, the shifting nature of public space in terms of who can occupy it and who transgresses it by being there, by virtue of being there. Inevitably, public space and the rights of the city constitute another key thread uh, running through many of the papers, uh, but this has not been as straightforward, uh, uh, and I think everyone has done a great job of complicating some of these ideas. Indeed, the detailed focus on street vending really does compel us to ask what kind of right is the right to the city, mm -hmm. right? As many of you have shown, street uh, food vendors claim the right to earn a living in public space, but the basis of these claims vary from place to place. There is no universal enabling warrant that guarantees rights to public space. Meanwhile, critics often object to the appropriation of public space for street vending, arguing that public space is a neutral ground uh, that should be accessible for all people and that it should not be the basis of private gain. However, of course, this view neglects the long, long, long history of forced enclosure, whereby elites expropriated vast expanses of the commons in order to install regimes of private property ownership. Thus, public space uh, spaces often comprise some of the few arenas remaining open to working class people to make a living, particularly in regions uh, where their labor is not absorbed into a formal industrial economy. So in this sense, public space is not only a convenience, it is no mere spatial affordance. It is an absolute necessity, a requirement for millions of people uh, to make a living. Still another theme has been the uh, effort to expose critiques of street vending as proxies for other kinds of social animus, uh, which in turn make their way into regulatory measures as, as, as we've seen. And here we call our discussion of nuisance and what constitutes a nuisance, right? I'm thinking of Sarah's excellent discussion of the ways in which walkability and pedestrian rights anchor opposition to the use of sidewalks by street vendors. Um, I'm reminded of uh, efforts years ago in St. Louis, for example, where I lived to ban drinking on stoops and front porches, um, an effort which was so patently charged with white racial panic about black bodies and behaviors in urban space. We've seen this over and over in the case of street food vendors. Their wares is often regarded with suspicion by authorities based on the identities of the sellers themselves, perhaps less, uh, less so than the food itself. And here I'm reminded of Jeffrey and Joel's engaging history of Kensington Market and the politics of nuisance, noises, and odors that emerge or erupt with the presence of Jewish vendors in kosher butchery. Here in New York City, the municipal government spent many years at the turn of the 20th century trying to clear out the so-called pushcart menace from 14th Street. And pushcart sellers were predominantly Eastern European Jews, Southern Italians, and African Americans. Uh, darker bodies regarded with suspicion uh, in, a, in a landscape which was increasingly home to upper middle class and wealthy New Yorkers. Another exciting theme has been street vending as an affective uh, urban practice with intricately negotiated norms, behaviors, values, temporalities, and materialities. Joe's work, uh, for example, shows how soundscapes produced by street food vendors change 
over time. Those changes reflecting political economies and cultural preferences. Ashley's superb study of food uh, and public culture in New Orleans reveals a racial politics at work, one which shapes not only what kinds of bodies uh, are allowed to be present in public space, but who has the right to make sounds, to call out, and to be heard. And then I'm also thinking of Ken's very helpful notion uh, on the uh, kind of aesthetic uh, moralities and how aesthetics, aesthetic choices reveal particular moral economies. In the end, and this gets me to a conclusion, I'm sorry if I'm going over time a bit, from my perspective as an urbanist, and that's kind of the field I come out of, the, the, the field of street, uh, street food studies appears extremely lively, engaging, multifaceted, and consequential. I think we're starting to see street food vending as a crucial urban practice, uh, one around which a wide range of interests constellate and converge, and a practice that uh, not only occupies urban space, but also actively produces the very city in which it is situated. And finally, uh, seeing street food uh, as part of a broader urban imaginary, not just a pragmatic exercise of labor and household whole economy, although it is that, uh, but a space of aspiration, a nexus of values and beliefs, and a landscape of, uh, a landscape of dreams for the future. So thank you.